Hi guys, Dino here. We're back with the terrifying music of Fear and Hunger 2 Terminer, but before we continue dissecting the soundtrack, I have to mention a few things. First off, thank you for the astounding support on these videos. Secondly, I have to express my gratitude to Miro Haverinen, the creator of the Fear and Hunger games, who not only wrote a very thoughtful and encouraging comment on my last video, but also shared it on Twitter for all of his followers to see. Thank you, Miro. I hope you have fun watching these. Lastly, I need to correct a mistake I made in the previous video. Originally, I stated that Terminus soundtrack was entirely made by Miro himself, and that is simply not true. Four of the tracks are made by Chili Makes Music, who was kind enough to correct me in the comments. I edited the description and my pinned comment to include this info, but I think it is important to mention it here again, as three of the tracks we have yet to cover are their contribution, so definitely check out their work. For those of you who have not seen the previous video, here's a short but important disclaimer. The game we'll be covering in this video is for adult audiences only. It contains depictions of extreme violence, gore, sexual violence and many other similarly grotesque things. This video will exclude slash censor these aspects and is safe to watch, just know what you're getting yourself into if you decide to play it yourself. With that out of the way, we can continue where we left off. Let's take a listen. Wayward Souls is the second track contributed by Chili. It plays in St. Tomek's Orphanage, one of the darkest places in the entire game. When you enter the orphanage, you immediately realize it has been long abandoned. Places like this tend to garner a not-so-innocent reputation, and as you walk through its long hallways, you see the clues. The music makes no attempt in hiding the sinister truth behind this place. The first notes of the melody already impose such a tragic atmosphere, you can feel all the suffering that has taken place here. The dreamy timbre of the melody, paired with the slow but hefty bass sound, have a nostalgic touch that is quickly stained by the increasingly loud static. This ambivalence is what sells me on Wayward Souls and its captivating sense of atmosphere. The string section in the background reminds me of oh so many tear-jerking movie scenes that leave you no choice but to bawl your eyes out as you feel for the victims of what must have been years and years of unimaginable abuse. The B section goes for a more wicked atmosphere, which is more in line with how I imagine it must feel to enter this abandoned building long after its last poor soul has been tormented. The melodies are sinister, the instrumentation is dark, the howling wind is ice cold. A beautiful contrast and equally fitting for this location. There is one incredible aspect about Wayward Souls I have not mentioned yet. It is not interrupted upon entering combat, it simply continues to play while you encounter the poor remains of what must have been innocent children. Every time I had to face these enemies, I genuinely felt horrible fighting them. Should I just run away and risk getting injured in the process? Or should I put them out of their misery so they can finally escape this nightmare they once called home? I don't know if there's a right answer, but every time I'm forced to choose one, it feels wrong. Listen, I could write pages on why I love this tune and how well it is crafted. It has the right amount of contrast and variety, while it is also coherent and all its various elements perfectly harmonious. The drumming is adequately reserved, the melody is beautiful and touching and leaves enough room between phrases to properly feel their impact. The mixing is superb, a lot of the elements directly reference or remind me of in-game occurrences. I could go on and on, but I think you get the idea. I'm not sure if I want to call Wayward Souls my favorite piece so far, as we did have quite a few strong contenders for that title and there are many more yet to be explored, but this track just feels different. It has so much emotional weight, it's genuinely moving. Kind of difficult to put it into words, honestly. Simply astounding.
Entering the moldy apartments for the first time is strange. It feels odd to say this, but even among all the other locations, with their otherworldly forces and moon-scorched inhabitants, the moldy apartments feel out of place. Like they don't belong here. This location feels quiet. There are enemies here, but nothing especially threatening or surprising. The most dangerous part of the apartments is the mold itself, since if you choose to sleep in one of the beds here, the mold will swallow you whole. The music is rather reserved, barring the few high-pitched sounds at the beginning. To me they sound like a mosquito, but I don't really have an explanation of what that could possibly mean. After a minute or so, a few more sounds start appearing, as if someone was moaning from the other end of the corridor. Once these ominous sounds disappear again, you can hear footsteps approaching you, and finally the track fades back to silence. A simple concept, well executed. The moaning sounds and the footsteps keep you anxious during your stay, but never go overboard to scare you off. I'm left with two questions though. What are these mosquito sounds, and why is this track called Sulphur God? Maybe we'll find out later. Rarest Dimension can be accessed from multiple locations, and the Moldy Apartments is one of them. Relentless is the first track that utilizes screaming or shouting in a very apparent way. This short piece features a voice screaming in agony from the very beginning, even though it seems to be clouded by some audio engineering trickery. As the track goes on, the shouting becomes louder and increasingly present, until it bridges into the sound effect that has likely caught most of us off guard. This sound is probably an amalgamation of various string instrument effects, but tends to remind me of nails scratching furiously on a chalkboard and car horns. Whatever it may be, it is loud, harsh and comes seemingly out of nowhere, guaranteed to surprise you the first time you hear it. This sound effect alone is what made me believe that this could be pulse and anxiety too, however that is not the case. The music surrounding the screaming at the beginning is both calm and worrying. It sounds like someone being stuck in a dire situation, not an immediate life-threatening danger. As the loud sounds are introduced, this obviously changes. Panic takes over, fight or flight instincts kick in and you feel the urge to leave this wicked place as quickly as you jumped into that washing machine. I feel like this track could have been longer, but it is looped during gameplay anyway, so I guess it's only a concern when you listen to it on its own. Aside from that, Relentless is amazing. Echoes of cruelty place in the temple district section. When exactly you will step into this part of town can vary depending on the path you take. First thing I notice is that this tune is mastered to a much lower volume than the previous one, but beware there are a few very loud sounds in here. At the start we can hear organ chords fade in quietly, making for a particularly sacrilegious ambience. Following the brief intro, Echoes of Cruelty contains a lot of downtime, where we can just hear one harsh synth note sliding from a high pitch all the way down to a much lower one. This reeks of desperation and is a common element you will find in a lot of movie slash anime soundtracks. Attack on Titan comes to mind. This is occasionally interrupted by a loud bell that is instantly muted, resulting in a rather glitchy sound. It almost sounds like a mistake in audio editing, but I'm convinced this is completely intentional. A peculiar choice for an instrument that is supposed to resonate in a huge parameter. 
This section is very heavy in its own minimalist way, and entering this part of Prahavil at night time suits the music even better in my opinion. The second half of this tune features bells at different pitches creating brief melodic bits as the low synth sounds become more present. A really cool element near the end is some strange low singing that does sound like it's some sort of throat singing. A person in the comments mentioned that this could be a nod to the track Minor Terror in the first game, which also featured throat singing. In the first game, I mentioned how I associate this way of singing with the cave dwellers, as they seem to be a native people that live in the depths of the castle's dungeon and center their lives around worship of the god of the depths. In Termina, there are no cave dwellers to be heard singing, so I'm not sure what the throat singing is supposed to do thematically. Musically, it adds another layer of mystique and eeriness that is certainly welcomed. Echoes of Cruelty is nothing too special in my opinion, but a suitable track for this part of the game. Mataneko Kone Magnificat is one of these tunes that you look up for the sole purpose of listening, but once you scroll down to the comments, you fall into a deep rabbit hole. Under these videos, you'll find people discussing the character who's tied to this track, Rancid the Sergal. Rancid does stand out quite a bit from the rest of the cast, from the first time you see him obliterating regular enemies in the streets of Prahavil, all the way to the moment you have to prove yourself against him. A power-hungry beast from the dark continent of Vinland who is in search for a formidable opponent. Some people argue that Rancid is not in line with the overall tone of Fear and Hunger 2. The character seems over the top, the dialogue can be perceived as whimsical, and Rancid can give off what some people have labelled as battle shonen OC vibes. Not gonna lie, there might be some truth to that. Another point of discussion is the purpose of the character, which is mainly an homage to one of the earliest Fear and Hunger content creators on YouTube called Neko the Sergal, who used to upload playthroughs of the game back when it was unfamiliar to most of us. I'll just give my two cents and talk about the music. I wasn't familiar with Neko, so I didn't know about this reference when I encountered Rancid in-game. He struck me as an odd addition to the cast, but not necessarily in a negative light. I enjoyed the connection to Fear and Hunger's Vinland, which was more relevant in the first game, and I enjoyed the different vibe this character brought to Termina, especially as a boss fight. Also, the few times I encountered Rancid randomly mangling other opponents in the streets of Prahavil felt daunting in a good way. His appearance and behavior does present a contrast in tone, and I fully understand if other players don't like the character for this reason, but I enjoyed him. It's all subjective in the end. And talking for hours about purely subjective things is exactly what we do on this channel, so let's get to the actual soundtrack. Rancid is first encountered in a church, so choosing a fitting instrumentation is key to build a proper atmosphere. The organ is probably the most sacred of instruments, and the intro it plays is very reminiscent of popular Baroque organ pieces like the Toccata in D minor, which most of you could easily recognize. I'm not insanely familiar with the classical organ repertoire, so I'm not going to comment on how authentic the use of the organ in this piece actually is. To me it sounds authentic enough, at least for the in-game context. Also, being the only piece with an organ as the main instrument is really cool in and of itself. I don't know, I like organs. They sound so monumental and powerful. For the rest of the piece, these pipes fade a bit into the background as other sounds push themselves into the spotlight. There is one repeated percussive sound that takes over completely around the middle. After a while, this sound trades brief sections of focus with the organ, which reappears briefly, only to quickly disappear into the shadows again. Even though these short sections are cool on their own, I can't help but feel somewhat disappointed by the overall chaotic structure of this piece. Every time I try to get into the mood of the music and groove along, it turns around the corner for something entirely different. 
I can see how you could tie this on and off feeling to Rancid and the fight with him, but from a musical perspective I find it a bit lacking. I do want to say I really like the female choir in the outro though, it sounds lovely. Alright, so there is a different version of this track, and apparently it is the original version. In the description, Miro states that he did not want to include this version in the game because it was too different to the rest of the OST, which I can understand. The piece is largely the same, however there are some noteworthy differences. The organ has a lot more uptime. While I really enjoy the more frequent presence of the organ, it seems like it's either been played very sloppily or not quantized properly. Listen how off the timing is compared to the kick drum. Kinda weird, considering that this doesn't occur in the other version, at least not as noticeably as here. Overall, there are other sound effects sprinkled over various sections of the piece. The ending is also noticeably different, like the short bursts of static noise. They sound a bit like attack effects from retro games. Anyway, they help the piece to peak near the end and leave the listener with a rather tense feeling. I have to say, I prefer the original version in some aspects. I like the difference in structure, the additional organ parts, and there is not much that I miss from the later in-game version. However, the sloppiness of the organ makes the original version sound a bit more like an unfinished demo, almost like someone was trying out ideas and quickly put them together to see how they would sound, leaving out the quote-unquote quality control for a later stage of development. While the first version we heard felt more polished, it also felt a bit more incohesive. I don't think I can name a clear winner here. Side note, I would really love to see a full-on Baroque organ composition for the next Fear and Hunger game. Wouldn't that be cool? I think it would. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Cathedral Whispers is, yet again, a very telling title, as the intro of the track mostly consists of whispers that slowly fade into monk singing. Very churchy, very medieval. I like it. The singing is somehow rather calming, and even though the windy sound effects and whispers in the background are probably there to throw some uncertainty into the mix, I can't help but feel somewhat safe when I listen to this track. At least safer than I felt in a lot of the other locations. The game follows the music in that regard, as the Church of Almer, the place where you can hear Cathedral Whispers, is one of the less dangerous places in Prahavil. There's not much more to say here, as the track is pretty short and subtle. But that's not a bad thing, I genuinely appreciate it for what it is, and it fulfills its purpose nicely. We arrive at the first song I have not encountered in-game. There are multiple ways of entering the church basement in Termina, and if you do it through the tunnel puzzle before cutting down the chandelier, you have access to a few more rooms and interactable items. Long story short, there is another boss battle waiting here that I missed out on, and the boss you fight is called The Heartless. This is yet another nod to a Fear and Hunger content creator on YouTube called Heartless Angel Ketsuki, who also did beta testing for Termina. I looked up their channel, but it seems that they have taken down most of their videos, barring the uploads of Termina's OST tracks. I wonder what happened to that, but at least the homage in the form of a secret boss will never fade. The music itself is quite enjoyable. The female solo singing at the start is nice and calm, while the melody is tense and anxious. Great pairing. We can hear the first part from the first game's main menu music throughout the whole song, which is a lovely nod as Heartless is based on a person that helped popularize the first game in its early stages. Very nice. 
The drumming is alright and makes Secret sound groovy, but the timbre of the drum kit doesn't fit extremely well in my opinion, and I'm not sure if I wouldn't have preferred this track to include some other form of percussion instead. Just a small gripe on my part. The other female voice on the right side is a bit more harsh, sung in a lower register and has more of a brato on each note. It's simply more intense, which creates a nice harmony to the first voice from the intro. Around the 2 minute mark, there is actually a nice rubato part, after which only the second voice remains, closing the first half in a very convincing way. The rest of the track is just more of the previous sections, which is a very good thing in this scenario. In the outro, all of the instruments and sound effects slowly fade out as the main menu music from the first game takes over. At the very end, we can hear some remnants of these voices cluttered together in the background, fading into obscurity. A magnificent end to a powerful track. I love it. In the northern part of the town, you can visit the Bohemia National Museum. Being the only museum in Preheville, it presents a variety of exhibition pieces, ranging from religious artifacts to deadly weaponry. Depending on your actions during the previous days, you can also encounter quite a few familiar faces. Midnight Hour has two main sections. The A section starts off with the ticking of a clock, some quiet strings and a dominant yet soothing piano. The piano has some of the dreamy qualities we've encountered in the early tracks, but feels more grounded. After a minute of this, some of these descending synth notes we've already gotten familiar with start to darken the mood. The track transitions to its B section, with a plucked instrument, maybe a guitar or even a harp, being the carrying piece. The soft notes of this instrument are covered in incredibly low bass notes whose pitches are barely recognizable. I enjoy Midnight Hour a lot. The A section seems perfectly tailored to the museum, the never-ending corridors, the surprisingly festive environment and a time of complete desperation, a slight nostalgic touch. When I listen to this, I'm completely immersed. The B section evokes the same feeling I had when I was rather late into the festival of Termina. Having had lost limbs, companions and suffered unspeakable horrors, I felt tired and exhausted. It was almost as if my main motivation to bring this tournament to an end was no longer fueled by survival instincts, but rather by the longing for completion. By the feeling of sunk cost. If I don't follow through now, what sense was there to all the suffering, all the pain? I parrot in my mind, desperately trying to convince myself. Deep down I've already given up, maybe I'm just too embarrassed to let go now. This despondent feeling is exactly what I hear in the second half of Midnight Hour, so it's a perfect match. While most of Terminus locations and buildings are dark, shrouded by a thick layer of mist or covered in white mold, there is a more colorful and vibrant place you can visit. Deafening silence plays in the foundations of decay, an underground cave system that offers a nice aesthetic contrast to most of the game, along with being one of the least dangerous places. The track itself has quite a few sections that are bordering on being silent. You can hear some incredibly low notes throughout most of the piece, some brief melodic bits here and there, a few sound effects. It's very reminiscent of the first game, since I feel like many tracks had a similar approach to this one. Through the slowly developing melodic idea, Deafening Silence manages to retain a sense of cohesiveness that some of the original game's tracks did lack though, so I can certainly see improvement in that regard. 
Someone in the comments mentioned that Deafening Silence includes a distorted version of the first game's theme, but I genuinely don't hear what they could mean with that. If you can hear a connection I've possibly missed, please write it in the comments. Overall, the track is not insanely memorable, but suits its in-game purpose nicely. There are two boss encounters awaiting in the Foundations of Decay, and if you choose the right path, you end up fighting an old friend from many years ago. It is Moonless, of course, now standing much taller, wounded from numerous battles, and impaled by two familiar-looking swords. The Night Delight takes a while to build up with a percussion segment, followed by some low bass notes to increase the intensity. This is not the only track that emphasizes its rhythmical aspect, but it has a unique vibe to it and fits very well with Moonless slowly stepping out of the shadows over multiple combat turns. Interestingly enough, the groove changes substantially once the next segment begins, presenting a calmer atmosphere with a soft piano that ultimately takes over the whole soundscape for a brief while. The piano turns the listening experience into a beautifully nostalgic moment. The characters don't know who Moonless is, but most of us players do. We remember her fondly, and now having to kill her off in order to advance feels bitter, to say the least. The piano reflects that perfectly. After this dramatic moment, the drumming takes over again, snapping you out of your memories back into reality. This ambivalence of intense drumming and melancholic piano represents the unwillingness to decide whether you want to spare this beautiful creature that once aided you on your journey through the dungeons, or to put your feelings aside and do what's necessary in order to survive. Of course, things can turn out differently. After you beat her in combat, our friend August, if he happens to still be alive, will intervene. He'll reassure that Moonless is a friend of the family and thus resolve the confrontation without anyone suffering deadly consequences. But while you still hear this tune, you don't know that yet, and that's what makes it so impactful. I really enjoy this piece and I certainly understand why it is a fan favorite. Another absolute banger by Chili. Great job. Under the Sulphur Sun sounds familiar. It's almost completely identical to a previous track called Green Hue Moon. This is the perfect moment to go back and watch part 1 of this series, as I'll be only mentioning the differences between these two tracks in order to not repeat myself too much. I'll see you there. For those of you who have already seen part 1, here are the differences in the music, some of which might point to something important in the story. The melodic motif from Green Hue Moon is pretty much identical, however it is a semitone lower in Under the Sulphur Sun. After all, you're finally at the tower in the middle of town, the one place you've been dreaming of the last few days. The melody serving as a light motif is not too far off, but why would it be lower by such a small margin? Maybe it's just to create a contrast, but maybe it's something else. Aside some of the rather quiet sound effects floating around the musical Meat and Potatoes, the only noteworthy difference seems to be the ending. In Green Hue Moon, we had these cello or double bass sounds, which I described as a callback to the main menu music, Dark Outside. These seem to be left out in Under the Sulphur Sun. On top of that, Green Hue Moon has its main musical components fade off into silence at the very end, while Under the Sulphur Sun introduces a low rumbling sound, reminding me of an earthquake. I could be completely off here, but I do see a connection between these noticeable differences and the names of these tunes. 
The green light was already an existing theme in the first game, indicating the influence of the moon god Rare and his servants in the dungeons. Green Hue Moon plays as our character meets Perkili, an underling of Rare who is holding the Termina Festival for his divine master, so the music is supposed to convey the feeling of the moon god's influence. However, in one of the endings of Termina, it turns out that Perkili is not the obedient servant we thought of him. Instead, he turns out to be the leader of the Sulphur Cult, a group of individuals who worship a new deity called the Sulphur God. Aside the very questionable movie we get during a particular ending, there is not all that much we can find out about the Sulphur God, although there are some very nice explanation attempts on YouTube. To me, the small but noticeable differences between these two tracks convey a feeling of uncovering a sinister secret that this ominous creature is something completely different than we thought, that the festival of the last days had an entirely different purpose, that when you thought you had gained the tiniest bit of understanding of this world and its supernatural roots, you are fooled once again. A subtle nod within the music, possibly even unintentional, but I very much appreciate it. All Mabels placed during the fight against Mr. I have dedicated my whole existence to worshipping this thing, apparently, who appears considerably more frightening when you finally battle him. I mean, compare his overworld sprite to this. It's pretty fucking eerie, isn't it? A very cool aspect about the Fear and Hunger franchise is that in the later stages of the first game, you get the opportunity to enter the Hall of Past New Gods and ask them a few questions about the world and its inhabitants, including the vast array of gods and servants. What's so spectacular about this is that Miro, the mad lad, has gone back to update the first game so that you can ask the gods about characters and events from the second game, which plays many, many years later. I really love this idea. If you ask them about Perkile, they will tell you that he only serves Rare in order to achieve his own goals. A very opportunistic individual, and undoubtedly a hustle legend among the ranks of Tommy Shelby, Tom Hardy and Hasbulla. I bet he tips his landlord too. Jokes aside, I like Pleakley's design a lot, and the twist at the end is very much welcomed. So let's get to the music. Alma Bells is slow, but with a steady pulse. I wonder how often I've said this sentence in these videos. Anyway, the track ramps up the tension over time until about a minute, where the music is cut off by ominous choir singing that suddenly reverses, I think? This music doesn't sound stressful to me at all, but rather it feels assuring in a way. Maybe it's Pleakley's confidence that he'll easily whoop your ass, or that something even more terrible might happen to you if he doesn't. Maybe it's the fact that you know that this is the end. After this encounter, it will be over, one way or another. No more suffering, no more desperate survival. Termina will be over. I do like that aspect, but I'm not sure if I would have preferred something more tense and sinister to finish the game off. After all, we've been through hell in order to stand here. A quick note on the title of this tune, there is a lot of speculation on what the Sulphur God actually might be. Some suggest that he is the evil part of Almer he left behind when he transcended, others believe that Almer was the Sulphur God all along. I don't know which is true, and I haven't done a lot of research on it yet, but maybe we'll get more elaborate answers in the third game, whenever that might come out. At least you know who will be ready to analyze the OST once it releases. To recap, Alma Bells is definitely a good one. Let's continue. If you manage to defeat Pleakley, he will run back to his daddy who left him when he was way younger and tell on you. Rare will then personally come down to the mortal realm and test your true capabilities. Not gonna lie, I find it a bit odd that Pleakley has the ability to call his former master to a plane of existence he had long abandoned, seemingly at will. Doesn't Rare know that his servant abused his power to worship another deity? Shouldn't he, like, delete him from existence as punishment or something? Is he stupid? Whatever, Rare doesn't seem to care too much, as if you survive some of his attacks and give his physical body a decent beating, he will simply lose interest in you and leave. 
The soundtrack starts off with some synth sounds that I guess are supposed to sound otherworldly and frightening, but honestly, to me they sound absolutely comical. Maybe that's also intentional, but I wouldn't bet on it. The strong vibrato on these notes, as well as some of the surrounding sounds, really make it sound like you're dreaming. This also takes tension away from an otherwise menacing final boss fight, but I can fully understand why Mira would go for this atmosphere. Old gods are beings beyond human comprehension, and encountering one yourself might be so overwhelming that your reaction is not fear or panic, or hunger. Instead, you find yourself in a comatose vision of what little you understand about this being. I've seen people argue that the final fight doesn't even actually happen, but is just an illusion your mind creates to visualize its battle against the effects of Moonscorch, trying desperately not to go insane before the third day passes. Either way, I really enjoy this one. White Abyss starts us off with some electronic sounds that deliberately appear robotic. After a while, a trumpet-esque sound flies across the soundscape, indicative of the danger ahead. You hear this track once you enter the bunker, a place of no return that will throw insanely punishing enemies and multiple consecutive boss fights at you. You better prepare well before you enter. I'm speaking from experience. In the second half of the track, we get a more traditional Fear and Hunger soundtrack with a low, rather quiet sound effect creating a steady pulse. There, I, I just said it again. It kind of reminds me of the rock slash dice sound from the first game's main menu music, although this could be a coincidence. What I described earlier as a trumpet sound is repeated again, although now sounding like a slightly overbone or even distorted trombone blasting across the room. It is very reminiscent of the loud sound from Pulse and Anxiety, and this change in timbre and volume creates an image of a much larger space we're currently in. Almost like the first half of White Abyss is you entering the bunker, wandering around its closed corridors, and the second half is you realizing how vast this underground system truly is. The trombone melts into the robotic sounds from before, foreshadowing the technological nightmare we are about to face. White Abyss doesn't necessarily stand out, but it suits the bunker very well and serves as a warning of what's ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long journey, but we finally arrive at the legendary Pulse and Anxiety 2 Electric Failed Prophecy. The music is largely the same as the first Pulse and Anxiety, however the biggest difference is the drumming, which is present throughout most of the track. While this does reduce the impact of the trademark tuba sound, it does add another layer of tension that increases the stressful nature of this boss fight even further. Also, the start of the track contains a brief descending low note warning of the acoustic jump scare that lies ahead, so it's slightly less rude than the original. The outro of this tune is different, as the familiar sounds fade out and get replaced by a repeated alarm sound, noises that sound like a plane is taking off, and some soft keyboard playing. Let us shortly talk about when exactly this track appears in Termina. While Pulse and Anxiety served as a soundtrack for a multitude of special boss encounters in the first game, part 2 is exclusive to one single encounter. Kaiser. Now, when you play Termina for the first time, you will hear this name pop up here and there, and if you piece the different information chunks together, you'll quickly understand that Kaiser is sort of the Hitler of the Fear and Hunger universe, having started the Second Great War with his Bremen army. To me, the outro is a nice addition to the Pulse and Anxiety legacy and suits the end of its corresponding fight. 
The keyboard gives you a sense of rest after finally defeating this antagonist, while also serving as a callback to many other tracks in Termina. In a way, it feels like it's supposed to remind you of all the hardships you had to go through in order to get here, and all the sacrifices you had to make to stand victorious in the end. You could also interpret it as the calm before the actual storm, as Kaiser is not the final fight after all. The alarm is there for a reason. But before we talk about what happens after Kaiser is defeated, let's take a closer look at this mysterious figure. If you pick up on some of the clues scattered throughout the game, you might realize who is actually hidden under this majestic yellow coat. This is quite a big spoiler if you have not reached this part of the game yet, so if you want to save it for yourself, skip to the timestamp on the screen right now. I've already said what I wanted to say on the music itself. It turns out that Kaiser is our old friend Legard from the first game. You know, the dude you were supposed to save from the dungeons? Quite a Scooby-Doo moment. Apparently, some of the endings in Fear and Hunger 1 are basically confirmed canon. Lagarde has survived the dungeons and has ascended in a way, likely being resurrected as a new being by Dars in her S ending. However, he failed to fulfill his prophecy, as instead his child, the little girl in the cage, managed to ascend as the god of fear and hunger, propelling humanity to a new age of suffering and technological advancement. During the last few hundred years, though, Lagarde would not give up on his destiny of becoming a divine being himself, and would use his newfound powers to work from the shadows, manipulating major world events and gathering a new following as the leader of the Bremen army. The underground systems of Preheville were secretly set up to conduct experiments on the supernatural, trying to recreate a cube of the depths and conduct research on the creation of an entirely new god. Kaiser invaded Preheville in order to take over these facilities and get another shot at true godhood himself. The result of all of this is uncovered after you defeat him in combat, as it turns out that he is not the last boss of this ending route. I love the connection between the soundtracks and the lore, as Pulse and Anxiety 2 only appears in this singular fight, which is, aside the Moonless cameo, the only major inclusion of a character from the first game. Sure, Enki has written the skin bibles, which help you in various ways, Nasra can be carried around as an accessory, but Legard is actually here, right in front of you and what was once the terrifying sound of the creatures you had to slay in order to save his life is now the sound of facing the same person as a powerful demigod. I love this twist and I love how Pulse and Anxiety 2 ties it together. Brilliant. We're getting close to the end of this journey, and what better way to kick off the last three pieces with the final song from Chili Makes Music called Unknowable. Again, spoilers ahead for one of the endings in the game. There is a lot of unpack in this tune that is directly connected to the story, so I won't be able to preface it this time. If you want to experience the endings blindly, you can skip to the outro of the video or come back later once you finish them yourself. If that is the case, I thank you for watching until now, and please remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content in the near future. With that out of the way, let's dive into the unknowable. We kick things off with a bunch of industrial sounds. The enemy we're facing is basically a large machine, so that checks out. The balance between these sound effects and the synth melodies is chosen well, but after one and a half minutes of it, there is an abrupt change. Do you recognize this motif? This is the melody from Mahab Streets, one of my absolute favorites from the first game, which plays when you enter the past version of the City of Gods. I adore this inclusion, and it makes a lot of sense, since the being you're fighting is a new god created by the efforts of the Eastern Army and, once he took over these facilities, our yellow Kaiser friend who, yet again, did not manage to ascend himself. The track continues with a slow but heavy beat, still incorporating the industrial sounds. There is something calming to it, but it is more akin to the A ending in the first game, where you witness the ascension of the god of fear and hunger. You can struggle through the fight, attempt to defeat the god, but ultimately you'll just end up in its grasp regardless. There's no point in struggling. This is the end. And in a way, this thought can be strangely tranquilizing. Unknowable is not necessarily my favorite tune, especially compared to Chili's other contributions, but it feels just right for this ending route of the game. 
Somehow it hits the exact spot it needs to. Fantastic. At this point, the only tracks left are the ending songs. Spoilers ahead, obviously. As of writing the script, Terminator has three possible ending scenarios. You get ending A by defeating all of the bosses in the bunker. You proceed to join the machine god in the artificial green, leaving behind your past life. This ending has some strong Evangelion vibes, I wonder if this is intentional. By doing so, you allow all the other contestants to escape Prahavil alive, so you're sacrificing yourself in an act of heroic selflessness. Or you're just sick and tired of the suffering in the real world, that's up to you. The tune for this ending is Green Ambience. The first thing I typically focus on is the structure, but Green Ambience doesn't truly really have segments. It's just one long soundscape, going for one specific vibe and maintaining it for four minutes. It manages to put you in a strangely comfortable coma, but I suppose that fits well with the story implication. Basically, you give up your physical body and material existence to become part of a collective consciousness, forever swallowed by the artificial green holding it together. This vibe is supported by all musical components, as every synth melody, sound effect and bass have all very soft timbres. No sharpness, no edges, nothing to distract you from this incomprehensible eternity. There is also no drumming or percussion involved, and low frequencies are fewer and far between. This helps the track to feel less grounded in reality and more surreal than it already appears. Good stuff. You could argue that the last minute is a little different as a loud melody is introduced and slowly replaces the other sounds surrounding it. To me, this marks the moment when you lock into your place in the Machine God's conscience. Or perhaps this eternity filled with warmth and empathy is merely an illusion that the newborn god offers you in your last moments before its otherworldly presence destroys your body and mind for good. Whether we actually die here or not, I suppose we'll never know, but at least we have a banger soundtrack to go along. Of course, witnessing the birth of the Machine God is not the only way out of Prahavil. You can also get Ending C if you eliminate all other participants, face Pleakley at the tower and choose to join his Dudu cult. In that scenario, the music you hear is All Work No Play, a track we've already covered in part 1 of this video. But if you decline, you have to defeat him and, depending on how far the festival has progressed, also the traces of Rare and Combat, resulting in Ending B, Day 4. As the sole survivor of the Termina Festival, you escape the grasp of the Moon God's influence and finally leave Prahavil. Each character gets a little epilogue, and some are considerably more depressing than others. The music you hear in this case is Dark Outside Extended. As you might remember, the original Dark Outside is Termina's main menu music, and one of my favorite tunes from the first video. The extended version is largely the same, but obviously has a longer runtime and a few differences that are worth pointing out. Before the familiar beginning sound, we have some underlying chords in the background that contain this warm, soothing feeling that we encountered in the previous track, indicating that at least the immediate danger is now gone. After a few shortened attempts, we finally hear the main theme, even if it contains slight variations, some of which I don't particularly enjoy, especially the one around the two and a half minute mark. This sounds like a typical chord suspension, where you keep one voice of the chords on a higher note for some time until you resolve it into the actual target notes in order to create additional suspense and relief. The concept itself is widely used across basically all genres of western music, but I just don't fancy the way it is implemented here. Something about the timing feels off to me. After another minute of this prolonged phrase ending, we finally get that low string sounds I adore so much.
Seriously, what instrument or sample is this? In the end, we're left with the background sounds from the start, as well as a few whistling elements that sound like the string sample was modified to a higher pitch and possibly EQ'd differently. All in all, I enjoy Dark Outside Extended, but I do have to say this is mostly because I love the original. The extended version doesn't do that much to add into the existing musical ideas, and mostly just prolongs them. This is not a bad thing per se, but if I compare it to the first game's outro song, Prelude to Darkness, it doesn't step up the musical tension in the same way, nor does it add new layers to the overall ambience of the track. Still, for what it is, I find it very suitable as an ending slash credit roll track, and the final minute of Dark Outside Extended definitely captures the feeling of leaving Preheville with your body intact, but your mind and soul forever tainted by the moon god's lethal luminescence. It is also a nice finale of this long list of impressive soundtracks sending us off into the final verdict. Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. Is the music good? Yes, in my opinion, the music is very good. In my first video, I already praised the huge variety found in Terminus tunes, and this has only been built upon in the second half of the OST. I enjoy variety a lot, and this game certainly delivers. Even with that in mind, Terminus still manages to keep a consistent tone in its soundtracks. None of them have taken me out of the unique experience of fear and hunger, and instead helped me immerse myself even more. That's a huge accomplishment that deserves a great amount of respect. The choice of outsourcing some of the tracks to a more experienced musician has also paid off greatly. Don't get me wrong, even with just Mira's ideas, the OST could stand proudly on its own and would contain all of the qualities I mentioned a minute ago. But Chili's four contributions have elevated this OST to new heights and offered us, the fans, some of the most memorable acoustical moments of this game. I mean, remember Wayward Souls? My god, what a track. I'm still confident that it is my favorite out of almost 40 pieces. It encapsulates everything I love about Fear and Hunger's sinister and depressive storytelling. Incredible work. Huge respect to Mira and Chili for going the extra mile to supply us with amazing music for this equally amazing game. I have enjoyed my time analyzing it greatly and also learned a great deal about how to approach video game OSTs. I genuinely hope that we'll get a similar experience in the third and possibly final Fear and Hunger game, but that's a topic for a later time in our lives. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I have a lot of fun making these videos, even though they are very time consuming. Please remember to like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment to tickle the algorithm. And thank you for your continuous support of the channel, reading all your comments filled with enthusiasm for video game music is what fuels my motivation to make these videos. Also, I want to say thanks to the Fear and Hunger community for supporting content around this game in general, the creators themselves for providing us with entertaining videos, and of course the developer Miro, who not only kept developing these games years before they rose to popularity, but also for sharing part 1 of this OST review on Twitter. I really appreciate it. I don't know if this is going to be the last video on this channel that only focuses on a Fear and Hunger game, but it is going to be the last one for now. Rest assured, more OST reviews are on the way, along with a few other cool ideas that I'm sure a lot of you will enjoy. Again, thank you all for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Take care.